All right, so now that was kind of the spiel, the government talk of Sanctuary is cool. <laughs> we have a lot of cool things. Now I'm going to give you a couple of specifics of work that I do. And because one of the things I want to, I want to get across to you guys is um, that when I, when we were grad students, um, it was sort of like, okay, your, your job options are, you want to go work at a university, you want to be a professor, you kind of do what, what Sean does. Because that's really cool. You get to do research, you get to work with students. It's very stimulating, it's great. The second choice was kind of like, well, maybe I'd work for an NGO or something because I feel like I'm gonna save the world. But even back then it was kind of like, eh, you know, no one's really saving the world, but it's a job. The last thing you want to do is go work for the government. <laughs> so the government was like, man, you blew it. You, you, know, you, you couldn't get into a university job. The NGOs didn't want you, but Uncle Sam will take it. And so um, that's kind of the joke. What I found is, is that because they're, because we've had a, such a change in the demographics of graduate students and both master's students and PhD students, and that there's so many of them, that there's a limited pool of jobs out there. So by necessity, just by hiring a lot of people, it's changing how the government kind of does stuff, which is to me a good thing. So anyways, here's one of the projects that I work on as a government scientist. You guys have heard about atmospheric rivers, right? Okay, so our rain patterns and systems are changing. Instead of having a rainy season with multiple kind of weak to moderate storms kind of drifting in, dropping in a half inch here, maybe an inch there, we're now having these atmospheric river events where boom, this stream of, of moisture comes in literally like a river in the sky and over a two, three, maybe four day period dumps 15 inches of rain. Okay, not a half inch or an inch, it just dumps. And then nothing for months, okay? So that's what's kind of depicted here. I just grabbed this from uh, 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 a news article, but I didn't think about it. I mean, I had heard about like the, the, the Pineapple Express, you know, and a couple of these things, but now these atmospheric river events appear to be the wave of the future, that that's how we're, in California at least, gonna be getting a lot of the rain, is no rain for a long time, and then potentially just one or two of these really intense um, events, okay? So, um, anyways, 30 to 50% of our annual precipitation comes from a couple of these events. It's just, you guys get it, it's intense. Right, next please. Now, the other thing that you guys, Unfortunately, for your generation, it's like you guys are getting used to, oh, beautiful orange sunset must be a fire again because we're having, in California especially, uh, just an crazy number of wildfires. One of them, which happened, um, basically it started in 2020 and ended um, it, right at the end of 20, it's in August and, and ended in December of 2020, was the Dolan Fire. So, you guys... Here's the little town, Luc Lucia, Lucia. You guys were, Big here's Creek. Landles Creek. Here's Big Creek area. So here's Big Creek. So this outlines the Dolan fire. Okay, so it was a very big fire. You know, where you guys were at Big Creek, um, uh, you, was Mark there? So you guys yep. met Mark. So Mark was like firefighting to save where he and his family live and the lab and all that stuff. I mean, if you guys saw, you saw how chewed up it is there in terms of, it, it burned, all right? Mm -hmm. It just burned. So think about, you have this fire happens. It's considered contained December 31st of 2020. Then in January, it was January, whatever it was, like 19th or 14th or something like that, middle of January of 2021, we have an atmospheric river event. So you have totally burned steep hillsides, oh, right? So all the vegetation is nuked. You also have a lot of the protective like structures and the, and the nature of the soil changes too from the fire and the oils and all this other stuff. So there's like geological, geomorphic changes going on associated with the fire. There's the obvious change in the vegetation. There's trees that fell down. And then you're going to come and in, and in 36 hours, 
drop 17 inches of rain. Okay, just bomb. Next slide, please. So you get, uh, this is a little bit, let me see if I can, uh, uh, third one's the charm, all right. Oh, this one's the, no, that's, yeah. Yeah, let me get this, there we go. Yeah, all right, sweet. there we go. So you guys drove over this. Yeah. I don't know if you stopped and noticed it or anything, but there was at Rat Creek, there was a blowout. This was a culvert, okay? Like a steel pipe, like, you know, this big around that it went under the highway and normally with the rain it kind of comes down and just kind of makes like a little spout, looks like a little hose. It got clogged instantly and it basically blew out the highway. All right, it just nuked. So, so these are cars here and just completely destroyed this. And then, you know, you get, you know, chocolate milk down below, okay? This happened in multiple locations in the sense of the creeks that that were in the fire scar, all of this dirt and material came down those. In this particular case, it actually blew out the highway. But in the creeks, I was in a creek, so one of the creeks, one of our study sites, which has a bridge over it, uh, or an overpass, whatever, normally when you go to this creek, um, even in the winter, when it's when there's been some rain, there's some water, you can leap across it. It's like two feet wide or something like that. Or you can go from kind of one stone to another stone, and you can get across it. And so, um, this is this is my boss. Hi, Lisa. <laughs> hey, everybody. I'll I'll Where alarm it. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it sounds like Erica and Abby will be coming back. Okay, right. Thanks, Lisa. Sure. Um, so, so what, ha what happened is um, this little creek that, again, you can hop over. We went down it, and the trail, and there was actually a road. Like, the guy who owns the canyon, it's private property, he had a road to kind of go down to his own, basically, private beach. I mean, these are really rich people, right? And that road got chewed up and blown out because that little creek, which is normally a couple feet wide, when the water came down, it was 40 feet up one side of the canyon and 40 feet up the other side of the canyon. Like where you could do a zip line from one side to the other. Because what was happening was, it's not just like there's water. When you have what's called a debris flow, you get a mix of water, which is mobilizing stuff, but then you have the dirt, the rocks, and the trees into like a slurry, so it's almost like cement. And it's sloshing around, like you can think of it like, like almost alive going down. So it doesn't just conform to the contours of the canyon. It actually kind of, if it hits a bank, it's gonna go up one side and kind of come down. And so the whole, I should, should brought it, I have pictures, but we looked at it, I'm like going, what is going on? It looks like some came through with a weed whacker and a mulcher and just took out every piece of vegetation on either side of the canyon, 40 feet up on either side, took out a dirt road, and there were trees that went down there that were fully grown, I mean second growth, but fully grown second growth redwood trees that went down like, like they look like toothpicks, okay? So this is what happens when you have a fire and you have a recent fire, and this can happen usually within the first one to three years of a fire, plus an atmospheric river vent, is you get debris flows. Okay, next shot, please. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of what happens. So now think about it. The debris flow happens at a specific point in time, right? You have, when that rain event comes, everything's coming down and it basically all happens in that window. You know, heaven forbid you're down there. Like if some poor guy was, was you know, camping down on the beach during a rainstorm like this, you'd be dead. Mm -hmm. And it's only in that burned area. When you go look like just beyond the fire scar at a regular canyon, nothing happened. The vegetation's still there. You can still, it's, it looks like no problem. And so what happened is all that material comes out. Now, what do you think, here's your question. What do you think happens when the material flows down and it hits the inner tidal. Does it stay there? Does it go out in the ocean? What do you think kind of happens over say a six month or even a year after that initial event? 
Because it could just stay there, right? It could move. It could go offshore. What do you guys think would have happened? Hypothesis testing. Yeah, exactly. I feel like the ocean would, would take it, but wouldn't it just push it back out so it kind of be distributed throughout? Bingo, right? So so the ocean's going to erode stuff. Nice, Max. But we, nice. But, but we know that the ocean moves it offshore and onshore. Seasonally, beaches build up and seasonally, beaches erode, okay? And we've got the longshore current, which is generally moving things south. So you have an onshore, offshore movement of material and the general flow downhill. So at the mouth of a creek, it was a war zone the first week or two, but really quickly it started moving down the coast. So think about it. You not only have the initial burial, you have the initial scouring of the ground zero at the creek, but over time, over months, and actually what we're finding now over years, all of that massive amount of material is gonna keep moving. And what we didn't think was gonna happen was it's gonna keep burying new habitat. Mm -hmm. So that's the part where I was like, whoa, I didn't see that part coming. So here's an example, okay? So um, I call this the, the sand crawler because when, like, when you're out there, it looks like you know, Star Wars. <laughs> Jawas, the little, the little uh, what are they called? The, not Jawas. The, the Jawas. What the Jawas are in there, on the, you know, they're cruising around on the sand. So it kind of looks like that from Lingo. So, I, so I, I'm the guy who names stuff. So like when we have rocks out there, like, oh, hey, that looks like sand crawler. And people are like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, Star Wars. Like, okay, we'll call it sand crawler. So, th so there's all these funky <laughs> names out there. So there's the sand crawler. So this was already... Um, in this case, there's already material here. Like this is not normal looking, but this is just a couple of weeks after the event. Okay. But there's still like, you can still see like, oh, there's some chewed up algae sticking out here and there's a water here and there's a bunch of rocks within another month. It's all, it turned all on its sandy beach. The whole area here before, which was like rocks and stuff, all buried by sand. So this is now two months after the debris flow. And this is like almost a half mile from the mouth of this particular creek. So we, so, and so why is this important? Well, it's killing everything as it goes. Like if there was stuff on the rocks, it's not only buried, but it's also blasted by, um, you know, the rocks rolling, the sand rolling. And like here, so here you see kind of looking face on the sand crawler like when I went out here there were black abalone which is an endangered species there's actually even red abalone there's crabs urchins there's all it's like a normal intertidal area. everything's grooving looks great and by the time we got out here we couldn't even find some of those some of those guys were just buried and presumably dead okay uh, next one here's another shot so this is what using a drone so one of the tools that we use which is totally cool my, I was like, man, I'm waiting for the day when like the government goes out and we have these little like, looks like a little igloo, with solar panels on it. And inside is a drone and every once in a while it just whoop, opens up, the drone goes out, it flies, it gets information, it sends it to the satellite, it shows up on my desk, the drone flies back into its little igloo, closes up and solar charges it. And it's like, <laughs> And maybe you go maintain it once every six months. That's my dream, my fantasy. That's my Star Wars. It's like, hey man, I've got like drones flying, collecting information for me, and I can just sit in my lap in my laptop and check it out. But right now we have pilots flying them, doing stuff. So, anyways, so here is what um, the front looks like in 2021, and this is actually like the same area. So this is the sand crawler right here, but looking at from the from the top. So this red arrow and that red arrow are the same thing. And then here's um, this particular rock. And I, I go climb up on this rock and take photos from this angle. And you can see, oh, there's water in here. I mean, it's, it's like, again, all of this stuff is new. This was not there. This is more like all boulders. Yeah, I know, Siri. It was all boulders prior to this atmospheric river event. So in just two weeks, you can see how the sand has moved in and completely buried all this rocky habitat all of the organisms that were on the habitat. 
And believe me, when we went down there, the very first couple times we went down there, it smelled horrible because it was just death. There were gumbu chitons, urchins, crabs. We saw fish got nuked. I, don't, I mean, that's got to be pretty gnarly for a fish to die. So it was, it was crazy. And so, um, and we keep going back. And we keep finding new areas of death as it's, as it's marched down. We think it's stabilized now, nearly like three quarters of a mile away, but we're still not sure. All right, next one. And then this is one. So this is a, I'm going to probably ask you to go back and forth on these in a second. Yep. But so this is one of the rocks. This is really close. Um, uh, this is actually up coast of, of one of the outlets. And this is what we call the big ab pocket. So there's this huge rock. And so what I want you to pay attention to is there's this line here, this red line here that kind of shows the shoulder of this. And then I put in a red line here on this rock that's got kind of these three little humps. Okay, show the next one. So there's Wendy. So this is a PhD student um, at UC Santa Cruz. And she, it's like, she got the coolest dissertation project you could have ever imagined. Because what started out was she was going to be like, Hey, I'm gonna do this stuff for black abalone where we like prepare for bad events in the future and she actually set all the stuff up and then it was sort of like oh and there are these fires and maybe maybe something's gonna happen and then all hell broke loose it's like the atmospheric river event she with a whole host of people we went out and we would grab black abalone bring them back to the lab um, and then we've translocated them to the areas outside of the fire scar because they were goners they were basically, and, and you'll see in a second, somewhat very, but, oh, so back and forth. So here's the red, all sand. You could walk out here. This was like knee high. Next, go back to the other one. And now it's like six feet down. So this is an area where the material was first there. And now because of that longshore drift and the movement down the coast, it's moving away. So some of the places that were buried are now becoming exhumed. That's cool for this spot, but that material is now going down south and still bearing other areas. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is one of the things that's like, and she doesn't have the capability and we don't really have the capacity, but it's like, if anybody wanted to do a graduate student project or even an undergraduate or a master's thesis or PhD, it's like, this you could start doing succession and look at what shows up, because it went down to bare rock. It was buried and scoured. It's like, you don't have the chance to go to a mile of coastline and blowtorch everything and go, all right, let's see what happens, what comes back. You know, that's just not allowed, but mother nature can do it. So anyways, um, we're just focused on the black abalone, but it's just kind of a crazy thing to see how dynamic these systems are. Okay, that's what I want to kind of get across. All right, so here's the black abalone. I've been telling you about the black abalone. Have all you guys, have, has any of you not seen, raise your hand, not seen a black abalone in real life, like a live one? Oh, probably most of them haven't. Yeah, I would assume none of you, so none of you have probably seen. So endangered species, it's, you know, the white abalone was the first marine invertebrate listed on the endangered species, under the Endangered Species Act. This was the second. Um, and so- How many abalone species in California? Seven. Seven. Good. Right on. So, um, next slide. They tend to be black, but they can also be blue. This one we, um, we call weight, uh, ruffles. Um, and this is one <laughs> of the guys at one of our study sites that is um, outside of the burn scar. So when we, we went in and collected a whole bunch of them, um, we went and translocated them to other spots where we thought they'd have a chance to survive because it was outside of the um, fire scar zone, but it was also in an area where we found naturally occurring black alley, like this, this old, old sucker. And there's a little guy down here too. Mm -hmm. Okay, next please. So this is what we were finding at multiple study sites in the fire scar. Black abalone that were actually on rocks and stuff, this, they, they don't, wouldn't normally be on this rock but they're actually trying to probably crawl out or get out of the area because it was just filling in with all this sand. Okay, next one, please. Here's another one. This is actually alive and it's just, the shell's just being hammered. One of the things we do um, is at, at one site in particular is we go back, it's probably now about every um, six months. It used to be um, every quarter, but now we go back about twice a year and we survey about a 
mm, 300, 400 meter stretch of beach, right where that sand crawler was. And we pick up all the black abalone shells we find. Because what happens is there's a lot of mortality that's buried. Okay, so there were guys who they were killed. And then there's, we find fresh ones that are just recently killed by the new movement of rock into areas where they've been okay, they've been untouched, but now have been recently buried. And so we go through and try and quantify old shells, new shells, and look at that ongoing production of shells, which is an indication of death because of um, burial. By amount of wear, is that how you tell the difference? By wear, and also we get tissue on them. So oh. you're like, oh, this, wow. this one's a freshie. Oh, okay. So you're like, okay, um, some of them smelling <laughs> pretty bad, like really fresh. Um, a couple of them we found that right at the leading front, we'll actually grab them. Like we thought it was a shell. It was a live guy. And we've been able to oh, wow. um, put them back <laughs> and at least come back the next day and go, okay, it's still there. We don't know if it's going to make it. But um, so it's just crazy. So there's Wendy. She's taking pictures. There's abs buried in. I mean, you literally, this was the joke, was um, the first time we went there, uh, sorry, the first time I went, um, she's like, hey, the inner tidal, you know, there's been this debris flow. I didn't, I mean, I didn't, I knew in theory what a debris flow was, but she's like, yeah, you know, um, there's a lot of buried abs and stuff. I'm like, hey, no worries. I've got a shovel. I found this on the web. <laughs> I said, you're, you're, you're I, you're oh, that's my phone? Oh, thing. sorry. Um, so um, I said, I've got a shovel. And she just kind of laughed. And I was like going, no, I, I'm, I'm a good shoveler. I'm, I'm like, I was like kind of <laughs> saying, hey, I'm pretty proud about my shoveling. So she got bring a shovel, you know, because I didn't understand the scope of, of the stuff. And it's like <clears throat> all this stuff, that all came down. So it's not like shoveling sand. It's rocks, boulders, things the size of basketballs. Some cases, huge rocks. So I had, and then I was like, when I saw it, I'm like, oh. Okay. I'm going to need a bigger shovel. Uh, we need like a backhoe <laughs> down here because this is, this is not going to work. Uh, my shoveling skills cannot beat this. All right. So we rescued um, over 200 black abalone were recovered. We had relatively few that were that died, you know, as a result of either us getting them or of injuries that they had. They went back to an undisclosed location, can't tell you, where they were um, sort of, you know, you know, they had fresh seawater, they had sea, it's kind of like you're in an abalone condo. You know, they, they were living good. What's the problem when you bring a whole bunch of animals in to a facility, um, uh, what's what's one of the things that might be you might think about and kind of go, oh, this this could be an issue. What's something you should be concerned about? Existing species. Well, yeah. yeah the, the good news was where we brought them into, there was nothing else there, so so they were good. But what about the the black abalone themselves? What happens when you kind of grab a bunch, like especially right now? If we grabbed a whole bunch of people from a bunch of different places and said, you're all going into like a gym mm -hmm. and you're going to live there for a couple of weeks. Bingo, bingo, bingo. So what's the disease that affects black abalone? Do you guys know? Withering, Withering foot syndrome. Okay. So the abalone, which we consider healthy in this area, which is like the last remaining quote unquote healthy population of black abalone if they are tested for withering syndrome they all come back having the bacteria okay so they just aren't exhibiting signs of withering withering foot syndrome mm -hmm. okay so for whatever reason they're infected but they're not symptomatic mm -hmm. okay so um what if you did have one go symptomatic or some other disease or What's another problem when you have something in, a, in an aquaculture facility? Especially in winter. If the power goes out or the seawater system goes down, then you have 200 endangered black abalone that even though they can live in the air for a bit, it's like, uh-oh, 
So there was a lot of concern about, let's not keep them here just in case something weird happens and they all get nuked because they were in our care. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so this is a shot showing um, Wendy and one of the um, Pisco technician or Marine technicians. So Marine is the multi-agency Rocky Intertidal Network. And this is a guy, uh, Nate, who works at UC Santa Cruz. And basically his whole job, his whole year is going out during the low tides, which is cool when it's during the day, but a lot of times they're waking up at like midnight to go out at, at two in the morning, three in the morning. But anyways, here we're handing out black abalone in the Trader Joe's bag or whatever it was. So we had them cooled on ice, you know, uh, not directly on the ice, but it was like they, they had luxury um, coming back. So we, they were putting me out, go ahead, next slide. And they got tagged up the yin yang because this was the first time Wendy was doing it. And I was like, hey, you can do these tags. These are the kind of tags I use for whelks. And then someone was like, oh no, use Z spar and put these tags on. And they're like, oh, well, let's color code them with nail polish and because we don't know what's going to. So I called them the disco abs, which didn't go over very well because I thought they were like disco abs. But, um, <laughs> so, but it's a way for us to try and track them when we go back in the field. So we said, we're, we got permission from the state and all the different entities to put them in certain locations. We had already looked at those locations. We had already tried to assess the native or the local, let's say it's called the local black abalone. And then we're gonna have the transplanted back black abalone. We wanna be able to differentiate between locals and transplants. So we're basically doing kind of like a mark recapture even though that was the attempt, we were trying to save black abalone, but then we also didn't want to just put them back out and not know, like, do they go anywhere else? Do they stay there? What do they do? Do they like this habitat, etc.? So we have all these disco abs out there. And the cool thing was, in some cases, they found a spot and like many black abalone, that's it. That's my spot. I move a little bit when the water comes in to go foraging, but I come right back to kind of basically like a home scar, like some limpets. And I'm just going to hang out here. Others boogied. And we sent, we found some within about a month that had moved 30 to 40 meters away. And we knew it was the same individual because we had all the tags. We're like going, whoa, I didn't think a black abalone moved that far in its life, <laughs> let alone in a couple of weeks to a couple of months. So that's been all super illuminating for us to understand, hey, if you had to do this again in the future, or if you wanted to do out planning, to black, for black abalone down, say, in Southern California in areas where they haven't been for the last couple of de decades and you want to restore those areas, this is good information to kind of understand, hey, they may not hang out where we think they're going to hang out. Even if there's local black abalone that say, this habitat is good, we're making a living here, it may not be the same for someone who gets outplanted. And who knows what a lab-raised black abalone is going to say. They may <laughs> go out there and just like, Where's my macrocystis hand fed to me, man? I, this is not this is not cool. You know, I'm a trust fund baby. Um, so, all right, next one, please. All right, so that's oh, just just go back. Yeah. So, so that's the black abalone story.